that's about it. Really. Um, yes, my publisher did want me to do a memoir, and it's, it's sort of difficult, I think, for a fiction writer to do that. I know many fiction writers have done it, but I know if I had done it, I would have been unable to separate the one from the other because I dwell in this on this cusp of fact and fiction all the time. And um, I needed, I think, a, a new light shone when I read this wonderful book that Maggie had written um, and thought, well, that's the kind of integrity I'm looking for. So that's why you were asked. Family 
that had a slightly different story, um, which is this Chinese Christmas thing. But of course, the truth was, as Maggie said, really mundane. Uh, and I guess they were just dealing with a with a grief. Thing. That's uh, that's the truth. Of it. Although I don't have grief, I have a growing up. I had a very very strong sense that this man whom I have never known, and as Maggie says, he was extraordinarily handsome and heroic to me. Um, he'd been an ideal, and I spent quite a lot of my life trying to live up to uh, both that uncle and another uncle who was an extraordinary man in many ways, who was a pacifist at the beginning of that war, and then a joint special operations executive and done extraordinary things. I had two remarkable uncles, uh, and Peter was one half of that duo that I had actually tried to live up to. I suppose I'd measured myself against them. Um, so yes, it meant a lot, and uh, I wasn't disappointed. It wasn't a matter of being disappointed because joining up when you don't want to join up, which you know he didn't, he did it because it was that war at the beginning of it. He was an actor, he was a rather good actor, went to Rada, he was talented, he was going places, and, and all my life I know that he never become a father or a grandfather or had a fulfilling life all because of this. And I know it was an accident, and actually, of course, it, it doesn't matter a damn how the thing happens. Uh, it's just that as a small boy, it was an important story. I'm, I'm sort of thinking that fiction has its uses, really. Yes, well, there's always the question of whether it's fact or fiction, and how it's fact or fiction by the life.
and came back after the war and became this editor. He was a high flyer and expected other people around him to be high flyer. So I don't blame him. I just think that's how he was, and he did his best as a stepfather. So I don't have any bitterness or anger about it. I, I'm sure I have hurt about it, but um, that's that's life.
Um, as I grew older, I realized that um, my father had been away. Uh, he was called Tony Van Bridge, and he'd been away, uh, like many men, uh, more often than he was at home. So we didn't really know him. And my brother Peter, who's my whole brother, we call him that, um, he didn't know him either. And I, I think that three year absence, and things happened, and my mother met Jack Morpurgo. Uh, and what, what happened then certainly changed my life hugely. I think what I do think, and what I regret a lot, is that if I, my father had stayed, and they had stayed together, both my mother and father were actors. And now I should love to have been an actor. And I think I missed, I really missed being Robert Redford. <laughs> uh, that's who I really, I, I wanted to be an actor. And now certainly when I get on the stage and I perform, which I do sometimes, uh, telling stories or whatever, I do know and think that I've missed what I'd like to have been. So in that sense, I'd like this come as a full circle. I think I'm beginning to find out that the actor and the other, I'm very comfortable with that. And I think Jack and Burgo, to some extent, steered us all away from that world. I wanted us to become successful uh, academics, and none of us, none of the children were suited to that. Um, certainly I wasn't. Uh, and it, it, it didn't work out the way he wanted at all. Um, and he did show his disappointment from time to time, that's for sure. Um, particularly, I'd say, with my other brother, Peter, who had a much harder time with than I did. To talk a little bit more about France for City Children, I mean, Maggie, you're in your account of it, you do suggest that along with the extraordinary achievement of it, and that obviously the marvellous experiences it gave to, to these children, there was occasionally a downside, both in terms of the strain, the hard work, um, on, on uh, Michael and Claire, but also on, sometimes on children who couldn't quite handle this sudden glimpse of a different life? Uh, yes, well, I mean, I think um, for anyone who doesn't know about past city children works, and it's still very much uh, how it works, it, and it's, it's, it, it's a very kind of thriving charity for children still going down to its, its three plants. Uh, every week, but children are taken from fairly rough inner city schools and go to spend a week uh, living and working, working really quite hard on a farm. And this was Mike and Claire's life for 30 years or something, running the farm in Denver, just near, near where their cottage is. Um, and the idea is to give these children a glimpse of uh, a sort of paradise that they will maybe never have seen before. Um, and of course it, it, is, it is wonderful and they produce this, these amazing poems and they say the most wonderful things about their experiences there. But for some of them, when they then have to return to their lives in inner city Birmingham or whatever, it is, it is pretty shattering. And there was a really sad story that I can't remember whether Michael told me or one of the teachers who came to children down of a girl who was found on the last morning of her week um, on the farm in Devon. Uh, having actually uh, taken an overdose and attempted to take her life rather than go back home. So it was a question whether, whether in fact, to give people a glimpse of paradise and then throw them out of it again is always a good thing. Well, it's a question, isn't it? Um, but maybe that's so as anything that's good in education. You have to show children what's there and, and, hope, and hope that they can, they can reach um, and fulfill themselves. It is very, very difficult, um, uh, and I'm certainly aware that that, that, that was a dilemma. It, it didn't happen that often. Mostly, I have to say, what happens now is when I'm doing readings and things up and down the country, which I do quite a lot, and um, someone comes up to me with two or three children in tow and says, I'm really glad to have met you again. Last time I saw you, you made me muck out a calf shit. Um, and I, it was really smelly. Why did you do that to us? 
So it's lovely. They have a, the memories they have, um, by and large, are so important. Ted Hughes once said, and I think he was right about this, um, that a child coming down from an experience like this, you can't prove afterwards what the value is when he gets back, when she gets back. You can't sum it up. You can't, it's not a clear thing you can say about it. But it becomes part of you. And he said, you probably won't know whether it's been successful until that person's become a grandparent and is telling the story, passing it on to a grandchild. And then you'll know, and then you'll know. And he had, I think, great faith that this is because it had enriched him so much being a child in the countryside. It had made him the boy that he was. And um, I feel that very strongly that glimpses for children are very, very important. Yes, they can cause difficulties and problems, but they're glimpses of something else, other possibilities. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a week on a farm, we could be going to a concert, going to a theatre, reading a great book. Um, they're so important because they can lead on. In the car shed, probably. <laughs> sitting at a desk 
It reminds me of school and writing like this. It hurts my shoulder, it hurts my head, it hurts my arm. And I remember Ted Hughes said at one point, because I was having difficulty with my shoulder writing and I'm moaning about it. He said, well, you should stand up, stand up, get a, get an easel or lectern or something, stand up. So I got one and I stood up and it hurt my feet. So that didn't work. <laughs> so I, I needed Robert Louis Stevenson. And so that's what I do. I sit there and I scribble and I scribble. Um, and then I'm really lucky because once I scribble a chapter, I give it to Claire, my wife, who types it out on a uh, word processor. And I'm not very good on word processors because I lost five chapters. Mum's not even trust them. Anyway, she types it out, gives me back a clean copy, and I think, well, that was something. And then I read it through and I correct it four or five times um, and do another chapter and do another chapter. It's like that. Um, but I have to be very excited when I'm writing. I think the more excited I am, the more I don't know what's going to happen, the more it works for me. Yes, and anyone studying writing's manuscript in years to come will be able to tell exactly where anyone's writing because you're writing against smaller and smaller. <laughs> 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 and how fair is entanglement on the word pressure? <laughs> yes. She complains a lot, it's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about how the two of you work together on this book. Fiction 
Certainly when I was writing these stories, I was aware of the fact that I was telling just as much truth as Maggie was. But I was simply telling it in a different way. I was trying to get out of the skin of the truth that I learned about myself in that chapter and tell a story which um, made it live for me, I suppose, and also helped me to remember. What was wonderful about reading these chapters was that, yes, there was the truth was there, but for instance, there was a whole chapter about my school days. I went to a, quite a monastic public school in Canterbury. Um, wonderful in many ways. It was wonderful architecture, amazing music, but it was a very strange world of the public school growing up. And I'd forgotten so much about it until Maggie had written the truth about it. And then it made me remember the details of a choir practice in an what we call the Undercroft, the Norman Crypt of Canterbury Cathedral. Extraordinary music that we sang. Pieces like Sped in Abbey. And it was in this dimly lit Undercroft, and then we walked back across these medieval cloisters, back home to our houses, and seemed a whole other world. But I wouldn't have remembered it had Maggie not brought the truth to the surface. And from that truth, I wrote another kind of truth, I suppose, which was the story about meeting meeting the ghost of Thomas the Beckett, which you don't do often. Um, but actually, interestingly, joking apart, you could not live in that place and forget Beckett. Um, Beckett was, I knew why I wrote it. He was a live person to everyone who went to that school. We all knew the place he'd been struck down, the stone that marked the place. We all knew where the knights had come in and done this. And we all knew the place that his grave, where his uh, tomb had been, and it was in my head so much, but it needed awakening by the truth. So the truth can awaken, maybe, and fiction can explain. I don't know. I sometimes, I mean, how do you get closest to the truth sometimes when you're in the Peter, but my father um, had 
Katrina kind of a hidden father. I mean, he'd been airbrushed out because at the time, just post-war, divorce in middle-class English families was, as you know, quite shameful and not spoken about. And I'd been given my stepfather's name, my real name is Bridge. Jack gave me his name, uh, and the family was brought up as one unified family. And anyone who came to the house, this was how we were. We were the most perfect family. And no one knew that there had been this divorce, except, of course, my brother Peter and myself. We knew. So it was sort of our secret. And we knew not to ask our mother because it upset her. We certainly knew not to talk about it in front of stepfather because we knew he'd be, if not angry, certainly. Uh, he, he would present it, so we just kept quiet. And this first father was airbrushed out. So the whole question of family secrets, um, which Maggie had touched upon with these letters, the discovery of the letters of my mother and stepfather, um, seemed to me to be something I could explore in a, in a novel. And then an amazing thing happened, which confirmed it. My, my wife, Claire's, uh, had, had a, an auntie. Um, who died last year, aged 94, I think. And the remarkable thing was that this auntie uh, had been a spinster all her life, but adored, absolutely adored, Claire's father, who was a publisher called Adam Lane, who was also rather handsome. He looked a bit like River Brook too on a good day. And kept by her bed, therefore, this photograph of Anne Lane, her beloved cousin, all alive. And last time we saw her in the nursing home, there he was, Anne Lane, in his silver photograph. And when she died, she left this photograph to Claire. And we brought it home, and the silver frame was tarnished. And so I, I rather like it. I'm rather, I rather like shining things up. I don't know why that is, but I do. So I said, I'll, I'll shine the frame up. And I started rubbing it and rubbing it with polish. And as I was doing it, the back fell out of it. The card brought back to the photograph. And this little photograph, tiny, tiny little photograph, like a body photo, fell out of the back. And it was a photograph of an officer in the British Army, clearly in the Second World War. You could tell that by his uniform. And hidden by this spinster art, and no name on it. So we have no idea at all who this person was. No idea what this person meant to my auntie. All I knew was that it was a secret. And I thought to myself that would be a wonderful way somehow of uh, accessing a family secret, finding out more about your past. If it could be more than a photograph, if, if it could be a written script. So that's what I, I did. I wrote a, uh, a book called A Medal for Leroy which was inspired by all this, and also by the life of one man, um, a, a man called Walter Tull. Some of you may have heard of him. He was the first black officer ever to serve in the British Army. He was killed in 1918. And there's an extraordinary thing about this man. He grew up in an orphanage in London, um, and was an amazing footballer. He was one of the first three black footballers to play at the top level in English football, played for Spurs, was racially abused off the field of Bristol Rovers at some particular point, played for Northampton Town as an extraordinary athlete, and then joined up the footballers battalion at the beginning of the First World War. And had the most extraordinary effect on the men around him. He was very charismatic and hugely courageous. He was promoted very, very quickly in a sergeant. And then, and no one knows why that happened, Another secret of Joe. Somehow he got promoted Lieutenant Walter Tuck. You were not supposed to be an officer in black. It was only for European pink people like me to be an officer. So clearly the person who promoted him didn't know he was black. Just before he died, he recommended for the military cross, which he never got. And then in 1990, I discovered that the Imperial War Museum wanted to put up a statue to him. And it was turned down by the local council. So you have this extraordinary man who didn't get a medal and didn't get a statue, but had lived this extraordinary life. 
Um, and so I created a story really inspired by that, but also inspired by family secrets. I don't know why I said all that. You asked the question. Anyway, 
this little boy, when he was away at prep school, he was coming back on a trademark. When I first knew, I could tell a story, but I didn't use it till later. I was sitting on a train coming back from East Grinstead where I was at school. And I remember vividly because it was the first time I fooled people with a story. We were coming back and um, we were all talking about holidays, which you could do the holes. Mom was going to France and in Spain, and I wasn't going anywhere. So I said, I have no idea why I said it, I looked at my Timex watch, which I was very proud of, and said, well, I do hope the train is going to be on time because the Queen's coming for tea at five o'clock. <laughs> and it was wonderful because every face in that carriage turned on it. It's just, just the best feeling. And I think I, I knew that again in that classroom. Loved it so much and I went on telling, telling, telling stories. And then my another te teacher encouraged me to write one down. And I sent it off to a publisher called Macmillan, who wrote me the best letter I think I've ever had. Dear Mr. Morbergo, we Liked your story, we'd like you to write five more, and we will pay you 75 pounds. And I thought, eat your hot up, roll dog. <laughs> we have a question in front here. You had your hand up before. Don't look like that. You had your hand up before. <laughs> Still in the legal process of it, 
But what used to happen is that families like yours, um, the police would arrive, or border police would arrive, six o'clock in the morning, hammering on the doors, and they'd take them from their flats, and they'd took them to a place called Yard's Wood, which was effectively a prison. So I learned that in this country there were children put in prison who were committed no crime except that their parents had brought them over here, and some of these kids had been here six years. They were in the schools, they were just regular people. And they found themselves locked up, with no place to go, separated from all their friends, and vowed to be sent back to a place where they knew there was threat. So I thought the story was worth writing. That's why I wrote Shadow. Does that answer your question? You pay me later. <laughs> I'm glad you do. Thank you. Good. I think it's gone in line with how I've grown 
as a person. I mean, I think I've grown in confidence, in the sense that I feel now I can tackle subjects. I remember when I first started writing, I wrote very domestic stories, stories about, about my family, about the school children that I taught. I, I tended to stick in the safe, in the safety zone. And the older I get, the more I don't want to do that, the more I want to stray into areas I don't truly understand, to make me research them. Um, and I suppose to widen my own understanding. I mean, I'm, as I get older, I, I know that there's less and less time, it becomes more and more urgent. Something, that story which was thought about a moment ago, a book like Shadow, or the one I've just written, uh, really inspired by Walter Tuck, is moving me all the time in directions I haven't been before. Sometimes I go into the same landscape, perhaps the First World War, uh, war that's often there's sort of good reasons for that. But I try to go deeper, if I possibly can. I don't know if I've succeeded. But I think I, I, I haven't learned wisdom as I've grown older. I haven't learned that taking risk is a good idea. Because she loves horses, not literature. 
but I think she loves both actually on a good day. Um, the, I don't know, maybe private peaceful. Have you read Private Peaceful? You have. Well, I think it's the most intense book that I've written. Um, I don't know if it's the most powerful, but it's the one in which I was most involved in when I was writing it. Um, so maybe Private Peaceful. But then maybe not. I tell you what it may be, actually. And I should say this because um, it's the first book I've ever written with my wife Claire. We put our heads together and our hearts together and wrote this book, which is called Where My Weddings Take Me, which is a story about a girl aged about seven or eight who goes for a walk in the countryside. That's her. And it's a magical story which changes her life. I rewrote the story because I'm a fiction writer, so I rewrote her story. And in between, we wove poems, the poems that we loved together and separately, then as children and now as not children. And so we made a kind of a poetry anthology. And it's been amazingly illustrated by a friend of ours and wonderfully illustrated. And we're really proud of it. It's like one of our best babies. Okay. Now the last question was um off the back of right. I suppose, for the same reason I write about children, I know them quite well. And I'm particularly, do you remember I mentioned early on, I have been in this team and been able to observe animals at close farm. I never look at them afar, I'm surrounded by uh, farm animals all around me. But I'm also in the middle of the countryside, so I'm very connected to the wildlife around me as well. So I go down to the river Torridge and I'll see sea trout and salmon jumping, I'll see herons lifting on, and there are swallows and larks. And, all that world is very, very close to me, not simply from poetry, but because I see it every day and love it. So that, I think, is very important, but it's particularly the connection between people and animals that, that interests me. Um, and there have been so many little incidents in, in my life where I've seen the effect of it. And I'll just tell you one to give you to illustrate it. Um, I think I mentioned I, I used to go up and read to the kids on Thursday night just before they moved back to, to wherever it was, London or Berlin or Manchester or wherever, on Friday morning after their week on the farm. And I remember one November night going into the yard, there's a stable yard by like this big Victorian house where they all come to live for a week, um, with my little notebook under my arm. I'm walking in this darkened yard and there was one night on the stable. And standing under this light, I saw the horse's head out of the stable and this little boy. When I recognized the boy immediately, he was a boy called Billy. Actually, he wasn't called Billy, but I'm calling him Billy because I can't give you his real name. And he came from a school in Birmingham. This school had been there all week. And I knew about Billy. Billy had a problem. He was a desperately anxious child, a very sad child. He'd been a foster child many, many, many times. And he had a major problem with his speech. And the report had come from his previous school that he doesn't speak. And in this school, he'd been there for two years, and he never spoken a word. And if anyone tried to make him speak, answer something, he would run off. And he'd done the runner from school many, many times. And the teachers had told me, whatever you do, Michael, don't ask him a question and expect an answer. And actually, don't ask him because it'll frighten him. So I could step back from there all week, and I just watched him, watched him, watched him. And he was wonderful with the animals. He had a real instinct, and he had no fear. So he was always the first person to put his hand in under the and the, to pick up the eggs and the first person to stick a bottle in a glass mouth. He just loved, loved the animals, never said a word to them, and he hadn't said a word to the children. And that's how it had been all week, and I'm walking into the yard, and I see Billy standing there, and he's talking. And he's talking 19 to a dozen about everything that happened that day on the farm, what he'd done. And our horse, he, he is standing there. And I thought, well, the teachers have got to see this. So I ran down, down to the vegetable garden, the wall vegetable garden and ran in and I fetched him out and I said, you've got to come and see this. And we stood there in the darkness where Billy couldn't see us and we listened to him. And it was really moving, it was extraordinarily moving to hear this boy talking completely freely. His tongue was loosened completely, it was so... It was a bit like a miracle witnessing him. But of course I knew why, I knew all that why. He was talking to a fellow 
sentient creature who wasn't judging him, uh, was not going to laugh at him, and he could speak his feelings. But then I noticed something which was even more important to me, and that was that the horse was listening. But had been understanding and he listening, and knew somehow that the important thing was to stand there and be there. And you could see her ears doing all sorts of stuff and her neck muscles. And she was loving it. She was loving the moment of connection between them. And it's moments like that I've been able to observe right the way through my uh, writing life, which I think has meant that I've included animals a lot in the stories that I've written. And I've even made animals tell stories quite often. And war horses are in war, so a horse tells the story. Um, very intelligent horse. Will you take that child out? <laughs> I tell you what I like. With the people in red at the back, go and stand in front of the door so that no one can get out. But particularly this child. A horrible child. What's your name? See you afterwards. Anyway, has anyone here been to the um, has been to the play of wars? Ah, Josie, well that's okay. I don't know if you remember that one of the wonderful things about the play is the music. The songs are, are composed and, and are very often they come from old folk tunes, uh, but they're rewritten by a wonderful man called John Tans, who's a great folk singer. And in this book, Where My Will Is Taking, we sewed up one of these songs, one of these poems, um, that we, we put it in. And uh, I'll sing you this. And you can sit still, Joseph. Stop twitching. Here it is. Cruel winter cuts through like the reaper. The old year lies withered and slain. And like barley corn who rose from the grave, a new year will rise up again. And the snow falls, the wind the year turns round again, and like barley corn who rose from the grave, a new year will rise up again. And I will wager a hat full of guineas against all of the songs you can sing, that someday you'll love, and the next day you'll lose, and winter will turn into spring. Plowed and sown, reaped and mown, the year turns round again. And like barley corn, who rose from the grave, a new year will rise up again. I will garland the body to daisies, to crown you the Queen of the May. And all shall behold the seasons unfold as surely as night follows day. Phoebe, her eyes, her gleam in her eyes, the year turns round again. And like barley corn who rose from the grave, a new year will rise up again. But there will come a time of great plenty, a time of good harvest and cheer. Till then put your trust in tomorrow, my friend, for yesterday's over and done. And the snow falls, the wind calls, the year turns round, 
and life by recall. Who rose to the grave? A new year will rise up.